Hello and welcome back. After looking into the careers of both John Lacey and Martin Brundle, I wanted to look at some other drivers who clearly had raw talent, but for whatever reason, it didn't translate into a top tier drive or top tier results. And the next driver I want to look at, like John Lacey, is a French driver with one F1 win to his name. But in fairness to him, it's a pretty famous win. Today, I'm looking at the man who was king of Monaco for a day. Yes, this is the career of Olivier Panis. My name's Ash. This is The Outside Line. Olivier Panis was born in Lyon in 1966, and like many of his contemporaries, got started in karting before moving into junior series. In 1987, or maybe 1988, we'll come back to that in a second, at Circuit Paul Ricard, Panis won the Volant Elf, a scholarship held by the prestigious Winfield Racing School. The Volant Scholarship was essentially a series of trials, the winner of which would be financed for a season in a junior formula series. Other notable Volant winners include René Arnoux, Didier Peroni and Alain Prost, so for Panis to win it showed his pedigree. The reason I'm unsure if it's 87 or 88 is because through research he's been quoted as the winner of either of those years in separate places. I think the reason for that is explained in this video where the trials seem to be taking place in October of 1987 but because it's towards the end of the year, Panis gets crowned the winner of the 1988 scholarship. Anyway, whatever year it was, in 1989 Panis proved he was worthy of that accolade, winning the French Formula Renault Championship and securing a drive in French Formula 3 for 1990. What followed were two solid seasons in French F3, finishing fourth overall in 1990, two places ahead of future French, British and world touring car champion Ivan Muller, and second overall in 1991, behind future Le Mans and FIA GT Championship winner Christophe Bouchou. These strong results led to an international Formula 3000 drive in 1992 with French team Apomatox. Round one at Silverstone, he managed a superb third place, but his season was practically demolished by six retirements in the following eight races. However, he managed to showcase his abilities once again at the final race of the season at Manicourt, with a personal best second place. He would finish 10th overall in the standings, one point behind David Coulthard and two points ahead of Alan McNish. For 1993, Olivier Panis was rewarded for his efforts with a drive at a team who will be a name familiar to modern F2 fans. He joined the French team, Dams. With a stronger team around him, Panis could finally deliver some big results, and at round one at Donington Park, he finished third, just like he did in last season's opener. Okay, he was just getting warmed up clearly, because at round two at Silverstone, he'd finish sixth. All right, Olivier, come on now, mate, please. Never mind, because at rounds three and four, he'd retire, oh, for fuck's sake. Fortunately, it would come together for Olivier after that, winning three races in a row at Hockenheim, Nürburgring, and Spa. He almost made it four in a row at Manicourt, leading the race until rain hit. Unfortunately, a jammed wheel nut in the pit stop when changing to wet tires would cost him, dropping him to 10th, handing his dam's teammate, Frank Lagorce, the win. Heading into the final round at Circuit Paul Armagnac, Panis was one point ahead of Pedro Lamy, with David Coulthard still in contention. But Coulthard retired early, making it a two-way fight for the title. However, disaster struck. More accurately, Vincenzo Suspiri struck. Suspiri accidentally took out Panis, and Panis was furious, needing to be restrained from attacking Suspiri in the pit. Fortunately, fate was a bastard to all the title contenders that day, as a damaged rear suspension for Lamy put him several laps down and out of the points. Panis swiftly went from trying to smash an Italian to smashing some bubbly, celebrating becoming F3000 champion in the pits. For 1994, naturally F1 came calling and at the age of 27 he would earn a drive at French team Ligier. Olivier Panis, Patriot confirmed. At the time of joining, Ligier were firmly a midfield team, aided by a brilliant Renault engine and some parts from Williams. However, the team failed to score a single point during the first eight rounds of the 94 Championship, but Panis was at least regularly outperforming his teammate Eric Bernard. Then came round nine, the German Grand Prix. Looking at the final results, you'd be forgiven for thinking it was wet weather chaos like that of the 2019 German Grand Prix. But no, under a sunny Hockenheim sky, the 1994 event saw an incredible 11 retirements on the opening lap alone, Jos Verstappen's now infamous pit lane fire, and only eight cars finishing the race. While Gerhard Berger delivered Ferrari's first win since 1990, it was a huge result for Panis 
coming home second. Even more remarkably, his teammate Eric Bernard finished third, giving Ligier their first double podium since 1985. Panis continued this form into the next round at Hungary, qualifying ninth, nine places ahead of his teammate, and picking up another World Championship point, coming home sixth. He even came close to picking up points for a third race in a row at Spa, but finished seventh. He would score once more that season, taking fifth in the final race at Adelaide, finishing 11th overall in the standings. Panis would only retire once all season, a collision with Gianni Morbidelli at the French Grand Prix. Not bad consistency for his first season. In winter testing at Estoril, Panis would have a new teammate for just one day. The teammate? Michael Schumacher. I'm going to cover the full story behind why this happened in another video, but in short, Benetton's managing director Flavio Briatori had bought Ligier in 1994 so he could take the coveted Renault engines off them and give them to Benetton. So Schumacher would drive the Ligier for one day of testing so he could get a taste of his new power unit. This gave Panis a chance to compare himself against the new reigning world champion in the same machinery. At the end of the test day, Schumacher was around a second quicker than Panis. However, in the subsequent testing days, Panis learned from Schumacher and brought that gap down to just 0.13 seconds. 1995 was a mixed season for Panis. While the amount of retirements he suffered increased to six, when he did finish, he didn't finish lower than ninth, including six finishes inside the points. At the final race of the season at Adelaide, Panis would match his best result from the previous year and finish second behind Damon Hill. There were some interesting similarities between this race and the 94 German Grand Prix where he also podiumed, as once again all the main frontrunners bar one retired, and only eight cars would finish the race. Clearly survival is one of Panis' greatest strengths. He finished the season in 8th place with 16 points. As 1996 arrived, Panis seemed to be in a good place. He was the team's lead driver, partnered this season by Pedro Deniz, and the team's new car, the JS43, was a solid development on last year's relatively successful car. However, the year started slow, with Panis scoring the team's only point in the first five rounds, grabbing sixth at Brazil. Many attributed this drop in performance to Ligier losing some key personnel, notably Tom Walkinshaw, who'd left after failing to buy the team in full, instead opting to buy Arrows. But after that slow start, came Monaco. Panis qualified 14th, which around Monaco is basically a death sentence. Speaking afterwards, he felt he actually had the pace to be top five, but was hampered by an electronics problem. His race engineer felt they had lost a golden opportunity. However, Panis woke up on Sunday morning to heavy rain. He recalled turning to his wife and saying, I'll finish on the podium today. Panis's wife thought he was crazy, but Panis knew that in the rain, anything could happen. In the morning warm-up, Panis went fastest. Most assumed this was due to running light on fuel, but when Flavio Briatori came to check, much to his amazement, they had the right fuel for the strategy. The rain had stopped falling by the start of the race, but the track was still wet, and immediately cars retired left, right and centre, world champion Schumacher an early casualty. But this was the sort of race Panis had already proven he could thrive in. He was able to keep his head while others lost theirs. As the track dried, it came time to make the switch to slick tyres. Hill blinked first, followed by Irvine, then Panis. And it was the right call, as it got him up to fourth. In third was Eddie Irvine in the Ferrari. Panis was quicker and made a daring move at the Lowe's hairpin, forcing Irvine to lock up. Hill and Lacey were next up the road, but were too far ahead. However, Hill's engine gave up through the tunnel, condemning him to never win at Monaco, and then Jean Lacey's suspension failed while he was leading, because he's Jean Lacey. Panis was now leading, but David Coulthard was chasing him in the McLaren, and Panis didn't have enough fuel to get to the end. His engineers wanted him to stop to take on a splash of fuel, but it would cost him the race win. So Panis asked his engineers what he needed to do, lap by lap, to finish the race on the fuel he had, and said if I've made a mistake, I'll take the responsibility to say I'm stupid, but if we do that, we lose. We need to try and win. So he avoided sixth gear, and whenever Coulthard got a bit too close, he'd increase the pace. And it was enough. Olivier Panis won the Monaco Grand Prix. And when he stopped in front of the podium, the car would not start again, as he had run out of fuel, judged to perfection. Panis had delivered Ligier's first win since 1981, 
became the first driver to win Monaco from lower than 8th on the grid, and it was the first time a French driver racing for a French team had won in Monaco since 1930. Unfortunately, the rest of the season was slightly sobering for Panis. While he remained consistent, his lowest finish of the season being 10th, he retired from half of the remaining races and would only score points on one other occasion, a fifth place at Hungary. Not only that, changes were afoot at Ligier. In August 1996, team founder Guy Ligier sold his remaining shares in the team to Flavio Briatori, and no sooner had that happened, Briatori was seen meeting with Alain Prost, who'd been after buying the Ligier team for a while. Briatori sold Ligier to Prost in February 1997, but with little time before the new season, Prost's first entry would essentially be a development of the 1996 Ligier, but with the word Prost on it. And you know what? It was actually brilliant, or at the very least, Panis was brilliant in it. He grabbed fifth place in Melbourne on the team's debut, then went on to qualify fifth in Brazil and finished third to secure the team's first podium. In Argentina, he then went and qualified third with only the two Williams cars ahead of him. On Sunday, he actually ran as high as second and was keeping pace with leader Jacques Villeneuve. Unfortunately, a throttle failure 18 laps in ended his challenge. In the meantime, Panis' teammate Shinji Nakano um, participated which is nice. Despite qualifying fourth in San Marino, Panis dropped out of the points to finish eighth, but got up to his old tricks at Monaco where he qualified 12th and again took advantage of a wet race to come home fourth. Then in Spain, after qualifying 12th again, in a race of high tyre wear, Panis took advantage of his hard-wearing Bridgestone tyres and made it up to second and was hunting down leader Villeneuve at 1.5 seconds a lap. However, an uncooperative Eddie Irvine, clearly still pissed from Panis' move at Monaco the year before, didn't move when Panis came to lap him, although admittedly the marshals were not waving blue flags, clearly because they weren't expecting a Prost to be lapping a Ferrari. Panis eventually got past, but it cost him time, and he would finish second, six seconds behind Villeneuve. Coming into round seven at Canada, Panis was third in the driver's standings, only 15 points behind Villeneuve. Villeneuve would later state that he saw Panis as a genuine threat for the title because of his pace and performances. Unfortunately, that threat would come to an abrupt halt. On lap 51, Panis lost the rear end of his usually stable Prost and hit the wall at high speed, breaking both of his legs. As a result, he would miss the next seven races, being replaced by Jarno Trulli, cruelly ending his chances of a title fight and more wins. Remarkably, on his return from injury at the Nürburgring, he would score a point, finishing sixth just six tenths of a second behind Pedro Diniz in fifth. It would be the last point he scored that season, finishing on 16 points, equaling his previous best total from 1995. Just imagine what could have been with a full season. 1998 saw Prost enter with their own chassis for the first time, the AP01, rather than a continuation of Ligier's chassis, and they'd replace their Mugen Honda Power with Peugeot engines. The results were, putting it nicely, shit. Gearbox issues meant the team nearly didn't start the season, as they had yet to pass a crash test. And once they did pass, the gearbox was heavy, unreliable, and threw the balance of the car off. This meant either poor results or retirements. For the first time in his F1 career, Panis would fail to score all season. The only point Prost would score that year would be Jarno Trulli at the chaotic Belgian Grand Prix, where both Panis and Trulli got collected in the opening lap mayhem. But the red flag meant one driver could run at the restart in the spare car. Why they chose Trulli over a man whose repeatedly proven strength is these kinds of races, with heavy rain and lots of retirements, I'll never actually know. The 1999 Prost car was an improvement, as Panis scored two sixth place finishes and became stronger in qualifying with the highest of third in France. But both cars were still kicking around outside the points, if it wasn't for Trulli taking advantage of another famously crazy race, the 1999 European Grand Prix, and finishing second, it would have been another dismal season for the team. As a result, Panis left at the end of 1999 and did something unthinkable. He joined a team that wasn't French, Jacques Hughes. Panis had a chance to join Williams, who were going through a rebuilding period and about to take on BMW engines, but instead chose to become McLaren's test driver so he could show off his strengths to other teams in a good car. And that he did, regularly matching the times of David Coulthard and two-time world champion Mika Hakkinen. 
As a result, for 2001 he joined BAR, who were only in their third season, and he would partner former world champion Jacques Villeneuve. However, BAR were still not delivering on their promise that they would be a top team, a broken promise that had seen Villeneuve struggling for the past two seasons, and would see Panis struggle for the next two seasons. His best result for the team would be a 4th place finish at the 2001 Brazilian Grand Prix, but for the most part he was back where he was with early Ligier, condemned to the midfield and scraps of points. While looking back at the figures seems to show Villeneuve comfortably outperforming Panis, at the time both team boss Craig Pollock and Villeneuve himself were impressed with how Panis had joined the team after a season off the grid and immediately was neck and neck with the former world champion, who already had two seasons with BAR under his belt. But as you can see, retirements plagued both drivers, and Panis had a run of seven retirements in a row to start the 2002 season. When Jensen Button joined BAR, for 2003 Panis took on a new challenge as another new team, Toyota, who were only in their second season in F1. At 36 years old, by this point he was very much joining as the elder statesman, offering his experience to the team and he made Cristiano De Mata, rather than building up this team for a title fight of his own. Panis did manage the team's best result so far, a fifth place at Germany, but he was outscored by De Mata 10-6. In his final F1 season, 2004, Panis matched his point scoring results of the previous season, two 8th place finishes and a 5th place, this time at the USGP. And this time he outscored De Mata, although the Brazilian was dropped after 12 rounds, so that might have helped. He stayed on at Toyota as test driver for 2005 and 2006, typically witnessing Toyota's best season in the sport from the sidelines in 2005, which saw the team pick up 5 podiums, 88 points and finished 4th overall. Typical. Panis completed his testing duties in December 2006 and retired from F1 to focus on racing and other series. He entered Le Mans 4 times from 2008 to 2011, driving an LMP1 with Team Orica who, yes, are French. You can take the boy out of France, but you can't take France out of the boy. He even tasted victory with Team Orica, winning the 12 hours of Sebring, incidentally beating his old F3000 rival Pedro Lamy, who finished third. Panis also came second in the 2012 French GT Championship, driving a Ferrari F458 Italia. In 2015, Panis formed an LMP2 team with, get this, former French international goalkeeper Fabien Barthez. The team entered the European Le Mans series, running Ligier cars, which is a lovely link back to Panis' first years in F1. Panis' son, Aurelien Panis, is also a racing driver, competing in world touring cars and the European Le Mans series, among others. Olivier and Aurelien even teamed up at the final round of the 2020 French GT4 Cup, driving a Toyota Supra of Paul Ricard. And you know what? They only bloody took the pole and the win in the first of two races. Still got it. Throughout his career, Olivier Panis got to compare himself against three different world champions in the same machinery and managed to be competitive with each of them. While his 1996 win at Monaco gets held up as the defining moment of his career, and understandably so, it was much more than just luck. He was quick in his own right, he got the strategy perfect and managed the fuel perfectly at the end to get the win. Actually, I think the defining moment of his career, unfortunately, is the crash he had at Montreal in 1997. If he'd had a full season in that Prost, he might have been able to add to his win tally and at the very least show off his abilities throughout the season in a good car. While this probably wouldn't have resulted in a world title, it very much could have got him a better offer at a quicker team for 1998. Instead, he had to focus on recovering from the accident and remained on the Prost ship as it began to sink. But he has the respect of multiple world champions, is universally known as one of the nice guys of the paddock when he's not beating up fools in the pit lane for ruining his race. And his sole race win is one that will live long in the memory of fans worldwide. Merci Olivier.